Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, so there's an amazing amount of topics there for discussion. Uh, the incredible features of the Wolfram language, the closure library that enable us to use that power, uh, all the way up to the model to explain the universe, black holes, relativity, a lot of stuff. So it will take a lot to decompress. Jordan, are you here with us as well to help? Hi, yeah, I'm here. That was a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we accumulated a long list of questions. Um, we want to start with the first computer science question then. Yeah, so we have the first computer science question here. Mathematica and Wolfram Language pioneered some era, some ideas that are only now being picked up by the, by the programming mainstream. One prominent example is the use of computational notebook format for interactive development. What would be the one idea from Wolfram Language that has been overlooked thus far, but you think it would be really beneficial for users of mainstream of more mainstream languages? Well, you know, to me, the fact that it took 25 years for people to understand the idea of notebooks is kind of mind blowing, because that to me was the simplest of hundreds of ideas that we had in the creation of Wolfram Language originally. I would say that the, you know, the biggest idea is this idea of symbolic programming. This idea that everything is a symbolic expression and you can manipulate things that way. That's the biggest sort of programming structure idea. The biggest kind of meta idea is uh, this idea of making a computational language, not a programming language. And that's an idea that, that in a sense, you know, we've been building this tower now for basically 40 years. And it's, it's kind of, it's interesting because it's something where it's not like anybody else is building another tower that's like it. We are the unique such tower. And that has both the good feature that we're the unique such tower and we can live stream our designer reason. We're not worried about anybody stealing our ideas and so on. Um, but on the other hand, it means that it's not trivial to explain what it is that we have. I think, you know, we've been, I, I we just, Mathematica just had its one third century anniversary, so to speak. And I realized that Mathematica has existed, Wolfram Language has existed for half the time that, uh, that kind of um, you know, production electronic computers have existed. It's a long time. And we're still, at the rate we're going, it's gonna be 50 or 100 years before people understand the next level of, uh, of concepts there. I think it is absolutely inexorable and inevitable that computational language is the way that people will think about interacting with computers. Um, it's surprising we're not there yet. Now, having said that, you describe us as not a mainstream programming language. We're not really a programming language, so we're not. We're not. Um, I think we're we're a mainstream system for people computing things. We're not uh, currently viewed as a mainstream language for people doing just programming. I would like to think that in the future, the that just programming isn't really a thing that people will mostly think about doing. They'll think about achieving things computationally. And I think my my vision is, you know, when I started using computers. Computers didn't have operating systems built in. It was just, uh, you know, you and the raw computer. Gradually over time, computers got operating systems, they got networking, they got user interfaces. There are a sequence of things that you can kind of take for granted when you walk up to a computer. Um, the This idea of having the knowledge of the world built into your computer and a computational language for inter interfacing with that, that's something that in time, eventually, people will take for granted for any kind of computer. I might say that, that you know, there's some gradual progress in seeing that be more mainstream. For example, if you go to Excel today, you'll find a data tab in Excel. If you pull that down, you'll find a bunch of Wolfram data types there where you can start uh, making use of our, at least our data soon, hopefully also our computational capabilities directly within any, any copy of Excel. So that's kind of an example of a, of a piece of uh, sort of fairly obvious mainstreaming that, that's happening. But uh, yeah, no, so symbolic expression, symbolic programming, that's probably the thing that has been the most um, not, uh, not absorbed. I think that it's worth understanding, you know, combinators, had their 100th anniversary at the end of last year. I made a big study of combinators at that time. Uh, it's interesting that old Moses Schoenfinkel back in 1920 had already figured out a lot of ideas about symbolic programming. Uh, unfortunately, it's, you know, 100 years later, people still don't really understand a lot of those ideas. And, um, you know, it's, it's a slow process, but we're getting there. Okay, so maybe we are going to go with uh, Wolfram Language and more business uh, question by Jakub uh, on Discord. So he said, 
I build customer facing business systems, web shop, data management systems, and I find that long, the Wolfram language fascinating. Thanks for the symbolic operation and making everything accessible in the language. So the natural question is, will I be able to build my apps in Wolfram language? Sure. Lots of, there are lots of big systems that have been built in Wolfram language. I mean, the, you know, Wolfram Alpha is one that we're very familiar with because we built it ourselves. Um, and it's the thing that powers the knowledge system in Siri and things like that. Um, you'll find a lot of large companies have systems running that are Wolfram language systems that are customer facing systems. I, I think there are a bunch of, um, a bunch of Fortune 50 companies have large systems running that have Wolfram language backends. Um, and the, the, the typical model there is, uh, well, it's either running a raw Wolfram engine. Okay, so there are many different deployment channels for Wolfram language. Um, the thing I was showing you was just the desktop version. There's Wolfram Engine, which is a standalone thing. There's a thing called Wolfram Application Server, which is a thing that supports APIs running against a containerized uh, system that you can run on, on, on your own infrastructure. There's also uh, the Wolfram Cloud. We have a public version of that. We also have a private version of that called Enterprise Private Cloud that is something that supports um, both APIs and notebooks um, on a uh, either uh, uh, in the cloud. So th those are kind of deployment methods. I would say that the enterprise private cloud and Wolfram application server are probably the two most popular for deploying um, kind of enterprise uh, uh, kind of applications. And by the way, I should say that with the with the closure link that we were we were just showing, um, that will all just work with Wolfram application server, enterprise private cloud, or Wolfram engine. Um, so you can you can uh, build those two two things together. Awesome. It looks like we have a hand raise here. Sebastian Crane, thank you so much for raising your hand. Are you here with us? Yes, I am. Thank you very much. Yeah, so um, if I recall your explanation of the visual summary earlier, so that's the um, uh, yes. Wolfram's, yeah, uh, there's that multi-way causal graph on the right, the red one, that shows, if I understand correctly, the areas of the spatial hypergraph that can update independently. And so, uh, roughly, uh, am I right? Not there? quite. Not roughly. quite. Um, okay. Okay. Keep going, though. And I was thinking that in classical physics, um, if you have a certain point and want to calculate the gravity that applies to it, um, that's a function of every other thing in the universe. Um, and well, so it, it, not every other thing in the universe, only the things in the past light cone of that point. In other words, okay. only those things which, from which a light signal could have reached that point from those other points in the lifetime of the universe or whatever. Yeah, I see. Okay. So in that case, there are still, um, in the perceivable universe, everything has uh, applied to that, the gravity for that particle. So that, that makes me think... Yeah. It, it, the multi-way causal graph presumably doesn't map onto physical space because I can't say that a single particle's gravity is updated independently from the one next to it. Hold on, hold on. Many, many layers here. There are many layers. Um, okay, first point, what is gravity? Gravity, okay. In, in, in the absence of gravity, if you shoot a laser in some direction, it will go in a straight line and the line will be genuinely straight. The presence of gravity is represented by a curvature in space time, which means that the shortest path is no longer a genuine straight line. The shortest path is curved because uh, uh, because the space time is curved. It's just like if, if, you, if you were on the surface of a sphere, the shortest distance between two points is not an ordinary straight line. It's a great circle path on the sphere. Hmm. So what's happening in our models is the, the presence, okay, th 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 there's quite a few levels to this, but, but the, okay, first thing is this notion of JD6, shortest paths, is rather straightforward to understand in hypergraphs. You literally are taking two nodes and you're asking, what is the shortest path in the hypergraph between those two nodes? That defines a JD6. Um, then the question is, what is, for example, what is mass and energy 
in these hypergraphs, it turns out that more or less um, energy is the amount of activity in the hypergraph. You have to be a little bit more careful. It's the flux of causal edges through space-like hypersurfaces. Um, it's, it's, it's sort of the density of activity, the density of updates in a particular place in the hypergraph. So what ends up happening is the effect of gravity is that what would otherwise be the, the, the presence of those updates kind of inexorably causes the geodesic paths, the straight lines to be, to be curved. Hmm. I mean, this is not obvious. This is a bunch of math derivation to show that that's, that's how it works. But that's, that's essentially how gravity arises in these models is that what would otherwise be uh, sort of where straight lines, where shortest paths are straight lines, shortest paths are curved because of the presence of these update events, which changes the structure of the hypergraph. Now, how that relates to, I mean, this is all this, this is kind of complicated and it's about a, a solid hundred pages of, of uh, mathy stuff to kind of go through the, the, the full story of this. But, but roughly the, um, let's see, the relationship, I, I mean, again, it's kind of complicated because the causal graph is a space-time causal graph. Those events are a particular, uh, eventually you can think of them as being at particular positions in space and time. Although remember the whole thing is defined just by a graph. So there's no intrinsic set of coordinates. The coordinates are merely defined by the connections between different things. And then for example, space ends up being a slice through this causal graph. And so you have to, yeah, this this is kind of complicated. I it's yeah. it's some. Um, I don't think I can do justice to it in in um in a few moments here. But but roughly, uh, and and even when you talk about particles, uh, the notion of a particle is a complicated thing. Um, and uh, in fact, something that we are hoping to be able to do in the next year or two is to actually understand how particles work in our system. Um, we amazingly and somewhat surprisingly to me, we've been able to understand things about energy and quantum mechanics and quantum field theory and so on without being able to identify this is the particular topological defect that corresponds to this kind of particle or that kind of particle. So we, we and so that's a yet different level of stuff discussing the effect of gravity on particles. And it's sort of a, a consequence of this general issue of, of geodesics in the in the hypergraph, but it's 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 a more complicated issue. Hmm. If if yeah, this, this is a, I I let's see, I can I can you can find on the web tons of details, but if you there's a big book that I put out, which is kind of at least the, the early documents about the theory of physics. And I I encourage you, I I think. There's a technical introduction there that I, I hope is quite readable that, that tries to go into a bunch of these things. Yeah, thank you very much. I think that um, that uh, idea of the like the density of changes in a particular area being energy makes a lot of sense. So um, right. I suppose my critical question was that um, it seems as if there are parts of that uh, graph that, in, that update independently and those are, have, um, do they have physical representations that are independent. If they're truly independent, that means there's an event horizon. Right, I see. So that, that's a completely different space in which, uh, well, it's a completely different uh, area in which gravity applies differently. Right, so for example, inside the event horizon of a black hole, you can have, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a quite separate thing. I mean, the, the way that, okay. So in ordinary general relativity, you start off with a four-dimensional manifold that represents space-time. And mm -hmm. there is a limit to what you can do with a manifold, a continuous manifold. You can't, for example, change its topology in any continuous way. A manifold, you, you, without like separately from the outside tearing the manifold, you can't change its topology. In our models, because there's this underlying structure that is discrete, you can have changes in topology, for example, you can have much more exotic kinds of structures than pure black holes. For example, one of the ones that we're really interested to go looking for is dimension fluctuations in the universe. So we think the universe is three-dimensional, space is three-dimensional, but our model suggests that it wasn't originally three-dimensional, that probably in the very early universe, space was infinite dimensional and gradually kind of cooled down to be roughly three-dimensional. And there's a decent chance that there are dimension fluctuations left over from the Big Bang. And it may be possible to detect those dimension fluctuations by cosmology experiments. And that's a, a thing of great interest to, to try to nail down. I mean, there are, there are a bunch of, bunch of totally weird effects that one wouldn't expect from standard continuum general relativity um, that, that our models suggest. Mm, 
thank you very much for your answer. I'll, I'll have to read more into this because it's quite fascinating to see, like the the universe as a ripple. I suppose would be the the uh, nice punch. Well, yes, and, and the other thing, to, if you if you really want to get um, sort of computational about it, here's here's a bizarre thing. What's happening is these functions that are applying that are the events, they are creating atoms of space. What are those atoms of space? They're essentially free variables. They're things which are like the variables that they're, well, they're, they're escaping bound variables from inside lambdas. So in a sense, the whole of the structure of our universe is escaped bound variables in some sense. Um, so uh, th that's um, th that's a, a very oh, bizarre, okay. I mean, that, because that's what's happening is that that it is creating new uh, new atoms of space which correspond to new variables, each each with their own in effect UUID. Um, so yes, that's it, fascinating. It's a, the, so that, uh, that 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 I suppose that justifies um, uh, not using Sebastian. Sebastian, we, yep. we need we would need to Pass make, to make some room for other for other questions. Right, oh. Thank right, you. you. Should, if you're really interested in this stuff, I recommend a we do a bunch of live streams about these things. B um, and I do a bunch of Q and A's in those live streams. B, we have a, a summer school about our physics project and actually a winter school also about our physics project. And um, if you really want to dive in deep, I recommend that. And that link is in the Zoom chat if you look to the right there. So that was a really awesome technical physics question. Physics question. We are going to back it up though and do a more, uh, a, a lighter personal question. So you probably have very many, but what is your favorite and strongest contrarian opinion at the moment? Something that many people may believe to be true, but that you know, or you think is almost certainly wrong. Oh boy, this is a bad time to ask that question. You know, as a science person watching a pandemic take place, I, I have many, you know, it's, uh, uh, I've been interested to see kind of the relationship between sort of the science that I know and things that have happened and I've been a little bit disappointed by, you know, I make sort of science predictions, at least I think of them, about what's going to happen. And it turns out that's not what happens, either because the science goes another way or because the politics and general societal pressures go in, in a different way. But I suppose the thing that, that I'm, I, I am curious about right now, it's not really a contrarian opinion, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a thing. This whole model of, uh, of, of physics and this whole idea of this sort of multi-way graphs and this multi-computation, all this distributed updating and so on, turns out that's probably applicable to the immune system. It turns out that, that one of the things that's happened in, in biology, biology is, a, is an area that doesn't tend to have much in the way of theory. People don't believe in theories. They just say, let's do the experiment, let's run a clinical trial, let's see what happens. And you know, if there's a theory, we don't believe it. Now, sometimes they're right not to believe it because biology tends to be just a really complicated, you know, it's like a big program that's been built up over the last 3 billion years and it's a big mess and it's full of gunk and it's hard to understand what's going to happen. But sometimes there are principles that are useful, like one that was from the past is, you know, when genetics was being developed and people were like, there are all these different effects in genetics. And then people realize that there's this molecule, DNA, that just stores digital data. And once you understood that idea, it became very clear what was going on about a lot of questions in genetics. In the immune system, there's a lot that's just not known about how it works. And the, uh, the thing that I that there's actually an old model of the immune system that kind of got abandoned um, and, and no new model arose that of any sophistication at least. And I kind of suspect that this whole multi-computation process of all these update events and so on is basically what's happening in the immune system. And that instead, this what, what lays out in, 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 the, in physics as physical space is shape space in the immune system. So you have these antigens and antibodies and so on, each one defined by a certain shape and you can think about, well, when we talk about this branchial space in, in physics, you can think about that as laying out the space of possible shapes in the immune system. And I suspect that, for example, immune memory is, is very much associated with kind of this dynamic network of interactions between these different kinds of entities in the immune system. And this is something that uh, what, once one understands it, a bunch of things that go on about immunology will probably be really obvious but they're not at all obvious right now. They just seem completely mysterious. And it's like, we don't know what's going on. We just have to do another experiment. So I suppose that's my, my um, I don't know whether that's a, um, uh, my, my main contrarian view is that, that it's worth doing theory in that area 
because one might actually be able to come out with conclusions one can figure out um, rather than just doing experiments and hoping for the best, so to speak. All so. right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so I have uh, another raised hands. Um, James, do you want to take the microphone? Sure. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks so much. Um, just for the next time I'm up at 3 a.m. thinking about all of these things. You mentioned a couple of points here that I'd just like to walk away with some clarification on. Uh, specifically, you talked a lot about metamathematical theories and topology, uh, lambda calculus and um, multiple Turing machines. And these bring up questions ranging from chaos theory, girdles incompleteness and the halting problem. And do I have to worry about a sudden universal collapse as soon as the universe realizes that it's operating in a finite space and can no longer continue? Or were these sort of just like analogies to help us understand what's actually going on or these actual concerns no, is, that affect physics? This is the real thing. I mean, in the sense that, you know, the good news is we're almost certainly not in a halting universe. The good news is if we were near the center of a black hole, we would have to worry about halting because that's what it means, that's what a space-like singularity is, is the end of time, it is the halting of a computation. But it looks as if we are lucky enough to be in a universe, and in fact, this is the generic case in this Rouliad structure, we're in a universe that doesn't halt. So we don't have to worry. And actually one of the more bizarre things is the universe is expanding in physical space. We don't know whether it will expand forever or whether it will eventually recontract in physical space. It almost certainly, can, will continue to expand in branchial space and in ruleal space. So even if physical space is compressed, it does not mean that there aren't degrees of freedom in the universe that are continuing to expand. So the, the, no, you shouldn't be worrying that the universe is going to end um, in, in, uh, uh, in a global sense. Now, in terms of, of um, well, let's see, uh, there's a question, will mathematics ever end? The answer is no to that as well. What happens in mathematics is the formation of essentially mathematical black holes. What is the mathematical analog of a black hole? It's a decidable theory. So for example, something like propositional logic is a Boolean algebra, is a decidable theory. Any, any question you can ask in Boolean algebra, you can just go crunch, crunch, crunch and get to the answer in a known amount of time. That's not true in fancier mathematical theories like piano arithmetic, the axiomatic theory of arithmetic. That's what Gödel showed was I had undecidability in it. There are things where there can be proofs that are arbitrarily long. There can be sort of proofs that don't terminate in piano arithmetic. That's not the case in Boolean algebra. So what happens in mathematics, I think, is that different areas of mathematics, you can essentially, when you have it, too many proofs, okay, so the density of proofs turns out to be the analog of energy in metamathematics. So just as the, the, the density of updates in physical space is like energy, the density proofs are like these update processes. So, so uh, the, uh, you can think about this multi-way graph as being a sequence of applications of, re of, 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 of laws of inference, basically, in mathematics. And a proof is a path in that multi-way graph, which goes from one statement to another statement. That's, that's proving one statement from another statement corresponds to a path in this, in this uh, multi-way graph. And so then it, it turns out that the, when the density of proofs is very high, you have, I think, this is, this is new stuff, this is a few weeks old, so this is not yet fully, um, uh, fully settled, but um, the, um, it, it looks as if when the density of proofs is too high, there is an inevitable collapse, like the singularity theorems of general relativity, that leads to inevitable decidability. And once there's decidability, it means that an area of mathematics is finished. It's over, you've got everything there. It's, you can, it no longer has sort of this infinite path available. And so that's, so in a sense, the picture of the future of mathematics is very much like the picture of the future of physics. In the future of our universe, we'll have a bunch of black holes where time has ended and then other things will be happening in the universe. So similarly in mathematics, we'll have a bunch of burnt out theories that have become decidable, but there'll be other areas of mathematics that continue to expand. It's I'll very, it's very weird now. that you, you can make those analogies, but but uh, that that's this is the my recent sort of excitement has been realizing that there are these close analogies between metamathematics and physics. All right, thank you. Um, 
for this question. So I'm going with uh, uh, the next question. It's about uh, the Wolfram language. So we go uh, back into from physics to the Wolfram language. Um, can you expand on the transformation rules on symbolic expressions and how you use it in the language, expanding on the example of function definitions and why it is such a powerful concept? Right. I mean, I think the thing one has to understand about computational language or programming languages for that matter is there's all these sort of things that computers can in principle do. And then there are things that we humans think about. And kind of the goal of language design is to make a bridge between the way we humans can think about things and the kinds of things computers can in principle do. And so one of the things that's important is to try to capture how do we think about stuff? And this idea of you've got a thing that looks like this and you want to transform it into something that looks like that turns out to be a very convenient way to think about things. Now, you say, well, what can a symbolic expression represent? Well, at the beginning, we thought of it as representing programs. We thought of it as representing mathematical expressions. Then we realized it also represents graphics. It also represents user interfaces. It also represents running programs. It also represents, uh, oh, just all kinds of different things. And so this one idea of symbolic expressions gets expanded to represent all these different kinds of constructs. And then it turns out that this notion of, I've got an expression that looks like this, I want to transform it into one that looks like that, is just a very powerful thing that maps very well into something that we humans are good at thinking about. Now, in terms of, of what a typical piece of Wolfram language code looks like, for example, object-oriented programming, what does it look like in Wolfram language? Well, there isn't such a thing because all you're doing is you're saying, uh, you know, if you say, I'm gonna make an object, it's gonna be called G or something. It's gonna be a G-like object. Well, you just have the head G and then you have its arguments or whatever the payload, whatever that thing is like. And then if you want to make a method for doing something with G, you just say F of G of, X blank or something, whatever the in innards of the G are, colon equals whatever. So you're just saying you're taking this thing that is now this sort of object that is symbolically tagged in a sense with the head G, and now you're saying what to do with it. And that's just something you can do just directly in terms of a transformation rule on a symbolic expression. You don't have to introduce sort of a meta level of talking about objects and, and, and so on. Now, another thing is, again, in terms of types, the language doesn't have any types or has one type, which is a symbolic expression. Now, that, that doesn't mean that internally it's not, you know, the actual hardware of computers is very much based on things that have definite types. So there's lots of effort internally to convert what is specified in terms of symbolic expressions at the top level into things that are optimally run in an actual computer as a computer exists today. And actually, right now we're in the middle of a of a giant project to make a much fuller compiler for our language. That's a giant exercise in kind of theoretical type theory and so on. Um, but but uh, you know the, the the main the main point is that it's it's just a um, I mean if you look at okay so when you look at design of Wolfram language, um, one of the things that I've worked hard on is to maintain a coherent design across the building of you know, 7,000 different functions and lots of different domains and so on. And it just turns out once you have this idea of symbolic expressions and transformation rules on symbolic expressions, just a huge number of things kind of fall into place. Whatever you're doing, whether you're doing computational geometry, whether you're doing you know, geo computation, whether you're doing uh, uh, other kinds of things, whether you're doing things with you know, cloud processes and so on, um, it's uh, it's just a, it's a very convenient thing. I'm not sure I'm not sure that I have a great other meta thing to say about it. I, I will say I will say one thing that um, this whole idea that it's possible to do computation by having transformation rules for symbolic expressions that you keep iterating until you reach a fixed point. I'm in a sense glad that I don't know didn't know the things that I know now about physics and term rewriting and so on that I didn't know those things 40 years ago when I started inventing this stuff because had I known those things, I might've been very scared because the fact is it's not obvious, you know, like, like for example, the universe as it runs in physics is a consequence of a non-terminating term rewriting system. Yet in our language, the language is based on the idea that you're gonna get answers, that things are going to terminate. And so that's kind of a, a strange sort of uh, uh, a strange correspondence. And, and the fact that it is a practical thing to just do term rewriting 
and um, uh, and then uh, and go to fixed points is a non-trivial uh, empirical fact about our language. I mean, it's worth realizing that if you type x equals x plus one into Wolfram language where x has not been given a value, what is it gonna do? It's gonna go into an infinite loop. It won't actually be an infinite loop. It has guardrails and so on, but it um, that that is something where you might have thought that you know x equals x plus one would just blow up the whole language, but it doesn't. And there, in a, in a sense, these are empirical facts about the way humans think about computation that 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 things like that end up not getting in the way. But there, there's probably a lot more to say about this. But but um, uh, that's probably about as much as I can come up with immediately. Thank you. That was a wonderful response. So next, we're going to go back into the more computer science realm. And Porks or Domus, aka Bobby Towers, asked on Discord, a really fascinating thing I heard you say about computer scientists was that they tend to have an aversion to heuristics and that a big surprise you experienced with Wolfram Alpha was that you found heuristics to play such a large part in interpreting natural language. If you could let me know precisely how badly I've misquoted you, and also, he's curious how, from your perspective, the rapid shift to machine learning has changed the landscape of computing. Are classical algorithms going to become obsolete soon? Okay, so a couple of things to say. So no, your quote is actually fairly accurate about heuristics. I mean, in for many years in designing Wolfram Language, I always wanted to make sure everything is very precise. It all, it's very well defined. You kind of know what to expect. Then we started building Wolfram Alpha, where we wanted to have just pure natural language. Whatever somebody says, we got to do the sensible thing with it. And what we realized is that you can't do that in a precise way. Human natural language doesn't work in a precise way. It's full of hacks. It's full of weird historical coincidences. And the thing that I learned, which surprised me, was that heuristics kind of have a logic of their own. Once you have a giant boatload of heuristics, you start to kind of understand how heuristics interact with each other. And it's a different kind of thing than what you expect with sort of precise, sort of uh, axiomatic programming language construction. So that, that's some... Um, that's about heuristics. I mean, it's a very scary thing. You know, when you're when you're doing like unit tests, let's say for a natural language understanding, you might think, you know, that uh, I don't know. You have a test that says um, uh, you've got uh, you know forty nine cents. What does that mean? It's some piece of you know money. Fifty cents. Oops, no, that's the name of some wrapper somewhere. Oh no, somebody else. Now you know you think it's a modular thing, and you're going to test you know 25 cents as a separate test. Well, that's fine until somebody comes out and says you know now I'm a famous rapper and I've got that name, and then then you know it, it just it is bizarrely non-modular and and messy in that in that sense. Now in terms of machine learning, uh, it's sort of interesting. The, the you know I think what we've seen is an evolution of machine learning that's very similar to the evolution of things like linear algebra, where you know there was a time when when sort of computational linear algebra came into existence, it, it allowed computer graphics to develop, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There was a period of time when sort of it looked like everything could be solved with linear algebra. That was the 1970s or something. Well, that, you know, machine learning is again a very useful methodology. It's very convenient for many things. It will not be the the you know the full story. Let me give you an example. When if you're trying to, you know, you say, well, why do we need programmers? Why not just have, uh, you know, why don't you just, uh, you know, tell the computer what you want in natural language and have it just do everything? So I had an interesting example of, of uh, sort of understanding that process. I was writing a book about Wolfram language and I had exercises in the book and the exercises consist of saying, here's a statement in English, now write a Wolfram language program that does this. The beginning of the book, when the programs are really simple, that was working just fine. I could write an English language sentence, people would understand what it meant, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. By the end of the book, the sentences, if I was gonna describe a particular program, were bizarre. They sounded like pieces of legalese and patent applications or something like that. They were you know, full of, full of complicated hair to be able to describe these operations that were corresponding to a program. And I realized that's why we built this computational language. That's why one would have a programming language as well, because it is a succinct way to describe these kinds of computational operations much better than the kind of vague thing that we have in natural language. For short utterances, it's great. You can use Wolfram Alpha, you can type in, you can even do that in Wolfram language. You can type a kind of a short utterance and it will convert it into actual Wolfram language code, a short piece of natural language you can do that with. But anything longer than something short, 
the tower just doesn't have strong enough foundations and the tower will kind of topple over. You, there's, there's too much sort of uncertainty in how the language is interpreted and so on to be able to do that. Now, you know, what's happening with machine learning and algorithms is in, in a lot of what is in Wolfram language is meta algorithms. So let's say you're solving some partial differential equation or something. There might be many different methods for solving that equation. A big part of what we end up doing is trying to automate the solving of that equation by having essentially a meta algorithm which picks between those algorithms. For these types of meta algorithms, we've long used essentially machine learning methods to, to build those meta algorithms. And that's a very useful thing. If you get the wrong branch in the meta algorithm, well, it's unfortunate, but it's not disastrous. When it comes to the underlying algorithm, it's not something for which you're likely to be able to use kind of the fuzzy machine learning kind of approach. And, and so, you know, what we find is there are particular applications that we've long used and, and increasingly use machine learning kinds of things. And there are other places that are just sort of hard algorithms where I don't expect that machine learning will be particularly important or relevant. Um, it's, it's for the, you know, it's, it's like, like when you're simplifying mathematical expressions, okay? That's a place where there are hard, precise transformations you can make. And if you kind of fuzz those out, you'll just get the wrong answer. But deciding which transformation to make is something that you can potentially do in a machine learning kind of way. And so the thing for us is putting in functions in our language, like classify, like predict, like feature space plot and so on, that are underneath using machine learning to do things, but which are sort of elements of the language and can be called in other places, that, that seems to be a pretty powerful thing to do. Awesome. Um, we have one more. We have somebody with their hand raised here. Jacobo Cordova Flexiana has a question. I just want to remind the audience here that we are prioritizing people with their hand raised because we want to get, we want to hear from y'all. We want to get you to ask your questions directly. So uh, let's hear from Jacobo. Uh, thank you so much, Jordan. Um, nice to meet you, Stephen. And um, congratulations for your theory. It's very exciting. I, I have some question about um, uh, all the space is like this atom of, of space who are fixed in some place. We don't know where is that. And we are recreating uh, through a complexity rule. You know, when I made um, this movement, uh, the atoms are uh, recreating by a kind of complexity for millions of years of evolution. So. Are you trying to find the rule of complexity of the universe? And are you using the constant of Planck, the mass of electron, the light speed, trying to figure out one atom of hydrogen or something? And if is this the way you are trying to figure out, uh, how can I um, trying to play with this computer, trying to find the... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so first point is there, there are two basic approaches one might take in finding a fundamental theory of physics. One is to take, <coughs> to take physics as it is, as we know it, and to try and reverse engineer from that to see, well, what could be underneath the physics as we know it. The other approach is to say, let's start off with a very simple model and let's see what consequences models of this type have and then build up from those very simple models and see whether one gets something which one can recognize as being like physics. We're more doing the second one of those things than the first. When you ask about uh, you know, speed of light, Planck's constant, mass of the electron, things like that. Okay, so the speed of light is just a scaling factor. It's just the definition of meters. The thing that the only fundamental thing in our theory is the elementary time. So there is a there's an elementary time, and the translation of the elementary time into distance in space is just the definition of a meter, basically, which is defined by the speed of light. Similarly, the definition of energy comes from Planck's constant. So Planck's constant, again, is just a thing that is a scaling factor that's associated with our human way of parsing the universe, so to speak. Now, something like the mass of the electron is something which in principle is derivable from our models. Um, we haven't derived it yet, but it is in principle derivable from our models. And what I think is going to happen, it's, it's a pretty tricky thing because you might think the electron has a definite mass, 0.511 MeV, whatever it is, right? You might think it has a definite mass, but even in existing particle physics, we know that that isn't true. 
In existing particle physics, the mass of an electron depends on essentially the energy scale at which you look at it. The electron has what's called a running mass. And so it has that the mass usually quoted is the mass that corresponds to essentially zero energy, looking at an electron with zero energy, kind of a, in a zero energy way. As you, as you change the energy scale, the effective mass of the electron changes. So similarly, when it's, it's a rather complicated thing, it depends on kind of one's model for the observer of the universe, what the mass of the electron will be. And so that's a, that's a tricky, complicated thing in which one realizes that in addition to modeling the universe, one has to have some kind of at least approximate model of the observer to be able to make conclusions like that. But, but I mean, this is a, the, the, the thing that is sort of perhaps, okay, so our models of physics depend greatly on a bunch of intuition that has come from, in my, in my sort of experience, doing lots of computer experiments. You know, one might have assumed that if one has a simple program, it would just do simple things. That is profoundly not true. And it is sort of the experience from realizing that that's not true that's led to this whole kind of ideas about how physics might work. Now, when it comes to saying, can you find sort of a mechanical identification of, oh, you have this thing and you can sort of think about it in a very mechanical way, um, in a sense, the that can be quite sort of dangerous because the things that we're familiar with at our size scale are really different from the things that might exist at 10 to the minus 100 meters and things like that. So it's, it's a little complicated. And you know, in my efforts to explain what's going on, I try and use analogies with things which are at scale sizes that we know, but those analogies are they're decently accurate, but the true story has to be coming from kind of the underlying computational processes and a bunch of mathematical physics connecting those to things that we know about physics and so on. So it's a it's a slightly more complicated chain of, of, of reasoning than than I'm probably giving it uh, doing justice to here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jacobo. Um, so um, we have a going in order, I think, and we have uh, Robert uh, with another raise hands. Hi there. Thank you very much. This is like really stimulating. Um, so I was wondering, you mentioned um, that, you know, based on the, the models, there, there should be anomalies in the universe uh, that are observable. And I'm wondering if there's any proposed experiments, just like, you know, there were all the experiments that kind of showed that Einstein's theories were correct. Um, yeah. So I'm just wondering if there are, if there's like sort of a X prize for proving this, you know. That, Not uh, yet. I mean, see, the thing is, there are a lot of experimental physicists who come to us and say, we'd really like to do an experiment on this. And we say, we'd really like to tell you exactly what to look for, because we don't want, you know, don't fly a spacecraft and go look for something when the calculation wasn't done correctly yet. Um, the, the, I mean, it's just the difficulty with these kinds of things is we know there will be dimension fluctuations. What will be the effects of those? Exactly what happens to a photon propagating through a dimension fluctuation? We don't really know. That's a piece of essentially difficult classical electrodynamics, and it hasn't been done yet. And so it's, I think we're still a few years away from knowing exactly what experiments are worth doing. I think the ones, I mean, we suspect, okay, so the, the, uh, the, there's several different classes of experiments. One are essentially making gravitational microscopes. So what we want to be able to do is make a gravitational microscope powerful enough to see the underlying structure of space. In other words, to see below the continuum structure of space. And the best candidate for where that might happen is a supercritical spinning black hole, where essentially what seems to happen is, so black holes, uh, as they're observed, they, there's a limit to the, the rotation rate of black holes that's been observed. And that limiting rotation rate has some consequences in general relativity. Um, but right at that limit, we think that essentially the, the structure of space is held together by a small number of causal edges. And that if the, if the black hole was spinning any faster, a piece of space would break off. And that's kind of why the black hole doesn't spin any faster, but right where the black hole is spinning at its sort of maximum rate, we expect there to be kind of a small number of causal edges kind of holding the universe together. And it is possible that there will be measurements from gravitational waves and other things that could be made in which you would see those effects. But actually calculating what you would exactly see and how exactly to detect it, that's just a lot of work, it hasn't been done yet. There are also a bunch of experiments we think might be possible with people's attempts to make quantum computers. In our models, 
the, the, the ultimate quantum advantage of quantum computers probably isn't really there, but there's still a lot of value in kind of looking at the um, uh, sort of making computers out of physical things that aren't just semiconductors and so on. And it, it's my suspicion, at least, that there are some effects in essentially many body quantum mechanics, things that people use to make quantum computers, where we will see the effect of what we call the maximum entanglement speed. So in, in, in physical space, there's the speed of light, which is the maximum speed at which influences can propagate. In branchial space, there is also a maximum speed. We call it the maximum entanglement speed. We don't know its value. We just know that there has to be a maximum speed. It's essentially the maximum rate at which quantum states can affect each other. And it might be possible in one of these quantum computing setups to observe that maximum speed. We don't know what it is. A rough estimate we have of it, and it has weird units, it's, it's about 10 to the five solar masses per second, um, which is, sounds very big. But the good news is that um, these, uh, these systems operate on short time scales and they have a large number of atoms in them. And so it might be possible to, even if that's the scale size, it might be possible to reach that. That, that scale size would also be reached um, in, uh, mergers of very large black holes. Um, if, the, if black holes the size of the center of our galaxy merged, then if we're right about that scale size, there would be an effect from, um, uh, from the, the, the way that the black hole merger would happen would be limited not only by the speed of light, but by this maximum entanglement speed. The bad news is an estimate of how often black holes the size of the one at the center of our galaxy merge is maybe half a dozen of them have merged in the history of the universe. So it's not a it's not an experiment that's easy to do. Um, so we have to, you know, that that's again that there, there are sort of issues like that that come up. But yes, we're, we're I mean, it, it um, we we'd love to have a more sort of complete picture of what actual experiments can be done. And I think I, I would I would I would say there's quite a lot of enthusiasm for people to actually go and do the experiments. We just need to know what experiments they should precisely do. Um, Thank yeah. you. Good good question. The, well. We have a lot of enthusiasm. We are getting close to time. We could talk to you all night, Stephen, but um, about 20 more minutes, I think we're probably going to wind it down. Right, okay, and that, that will work for me too. I, perfect. I, I'm late for something. Well, it, and so with that being said, I know that Edward Hughes had asked a question in the Discord um, in regards to a speaker we have tomorrow. And I also see that Edward has his hand raised now. So I will go ahead and let him ask the question directly. Hi, hi, Stephen. Uh, thanks. Thanks for your time talking just today. Uh, I was wondering um, if you had any familiar, familiar uh, familiarity with the work that uh, Gerald Sussman has, has done with structure and interpretation of classical mechanics, which is similar uh, in this approach uh, of, of using a computer to sort of feel our way down, like the the sort of possible many worlds we might be in, and like what rules uh, actually run them. Uh, and so I was but wondering. That wouldn't be quite my interpretation of Jerry Sussman's work, though. I think you know his primary interest has been in doing things like predicting the behavior of the solar system over over the course of long periods of time, mm -hmm. and that's that's a problem of kind of solving gravitational end body problems. Um, one thing that's interesting about gravitational end body problems is they're hard to solve. When Newton was originally working on these things and tried to solve the problem of the motion of the moon, for example, famous, famous fact in history of science, you know, Newton had this whole theory of gravity and so on. And uh, he has this big chapter where he tries to predict the motion of the moon and he gets the answer wrong by a factor of two. And he kind of ends the chapter by just saying it's wrong by a factor of two. Now, some people might have said, oh, that means the theory must be wrong. In fact, what happened is that the calculation was really hard and he didn't manage to do it at that time. It took another 150 years for it to be done decently accurately. And what Newton, in fact, already knew, I think he said, uh, you know, to know the effect of the motion of many planets orbiting according to mutual gravity, I think he said, exceeds, if I'm not mistaken, the force of any human mind. Mm -hmm. And so he was kind of understanding the beginnings of this phenomenon of computational irreducibility that I've studied a lot. This idea that even though you know the rules by which the system operates, actually knowing what will happen can be very hard. And that's what Jerry Sussman, for example, in his sort of digital orrery efforts and so on, um, and Jack Wisdom and so on, uh, ran into was this whole question of even though you know the rules, 
actually working out the consequences to see what it will mean for the solar system. You know, how many planets might have been ejected in the history of the solar system? What, you know, the, the, the solar system as it exists today is sort of the result, presumably, of a certain degree of natural selection among planets. We don't know how many there were originally. It's hard to tell. It's hard to tell uh, all these things. That, that's kind of a, a sign of this phenomenon of computational irreducibility. This question of whether the, the, for example, even the three body problem, the earth, moon, sun, mutual gravity problem, it's likely that that, can, that you can make a universal computer out of just that uh, three body gravitational problem. Nobody has figured out quite how to do it, but it's likely that that's the case. In terms of the relationship to what we're doing, there is one sort of nasty extra complication in the Jerry Sussman kind of uh, way of doing celestial mechanics and so on, which is, the traditional approach to doing celestial mechanics involves calculus and involves continuous numbers. It involves saying the position of the Earth is exactly this to a thousand decimal places or a million decimal places or whatever else. There's no sort of computationally finite description of like what the position of the Earth is. It's sort of an infinite sequence of digits that describes it. And that that idea that you can have this sort of infinite precision, it kind of takes it out of the realm of what one can think about in the kind of the computational way that I've been thinking. And people, people in physics had thought for a very long time. And I think, I think probably until, I think probably my efforts in the 1980s sort of finally convinced people that maybe it was worth thinking about kind of uh, not having physics be based on calculus and real numbers and so on. Um, because when, cal when physics is based on calculus and real numbers, computation and theory of computation and Turing machines and all these things about computability and so on, they don't really apply because those things are really creatures of discrete integer-like operations. So it's kind of a, a slightly separate branch, this, this kind of branch of thinking about kind of the, the continuous mathematics version versus the discrete mathematics uh, kind of approach. So we have another couple of questions. Uh, the next one is from Christopher Small, who is up in the in the line. Hi, Stephen. Uh, Hi good to see you. Thanks for your thanks for your talk. Uh, it's really cool to see. Um, yeah, just the whole presentation. Um, well, thanks for making that stuff work. Yeah. 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 No, it was uh, it was it definitely was a pleasure uh, getting to chat with you and um, and uh, work on the project and looking forward to carrying it on. So the question I have is actually a physics question, though. Um, one just a point of clarification: When you were describing entanglement in these in these uh, multigraphs um, or hypergraphs, uh, are we talking about quantum mechanical entanglement there? Yes, um, the same thing. Yeah, great. Yeah, and so as a follow up question to that, then can you describe? Um, I'm I, I'm trying to I'm trying to get my wrap my head around how this helps us think about quantum collapse and kind of in particular as it relates to quantum entanglement, but 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 just in general, does this does this give you a way of kind of yes. making that make a little bit more sense? Yes. Great. Could you describe that? Yeah. A so, bit? so, so basically, the point is this: the you know, in this multi-way graph, there are many different histories. The universe is is following many histories. Those histories are branching, they're merging. There are lots of different histories. Now, the surprise is that you and I think that definite things are happening in the world. How can that be? If the universe is following all these different histories, how can it be that we think definite things are happening? Okay, well, here's where it gets really, really funky, which is we are embedded in this universe. So our brains are also doing that kind of branching and merging of histories. So at any moment, our, our brains kind of are, are also part of that branching and merging process. So in a sense, the story of quantum mechanics is a story of how does a branching brain perceive a branching universe? So in other words, you know, you'd think, oh, we, there's this branching universe. How come we're not seeing all these different possibilities? Well, it's because our brains are branching as well. And the key thing is that we have the idea that definite things happen. And the next question is, is it consistent to think that definite things happen? So we might say in our brains, there are these multiple branches going on and we conflate those branches together. In a sort of technical sense, we can say we, we add a critical pair lemma to our theorem prover. We're saying there are actually two different branches, but we're gonna conflate those two branches. And we might say, uh, great, we can do that, but it might be the case that that just doesn't work, that the universe, that having conflated those branches, there's then an inconsistency later on. But it turns out this phenomenon of causal invariance uh, guarantees that that will not be the case. In other words, it guarantees that eventually 
the universe will arrange itself so that uh, it will have been consistent for us to assume that those different branches of history were conflated. Now, a way to think about it a little bit more is in physical space, we are very big compared to the atoms of space. So let's say that the elementary length is 10 to the minus 100 meters, for example, we are you know, huge compared to that. We're actually on the, on the scale between the maximum, the size of the universe, 10 to the 26 meters, and the elementary length, we are definitely on the big end in terms of things in the universe. Now, the next question is, that's physical space. The next question is, how big are we in branchial space? In other words, how many separate quantum histories are we encompassing at a given time? I don't know the answer to this, but I think what's happening is that we are just as we are effectively sampling very large numbers of atoms of space, because we're so big compared to the atoms of space, we're also sampling many different threads of history, so to speak. And, and that's and, and essentially the reason that we perceive classical mechanics to be the way it is, is that we are essentially averaging over many threads of history. Um, and that it is actually a rare thing, just like if you're looking at a gas, it's a rare thing to find a single molecule that really matters. You have to do you know, hypersonic flow or you have to do Brownian motion, something like that, to find a place where, where a gas is not just seeming like a continuous fluid. That's because we're pretty big compared to the molecules in a gas. And so similarly in quantum mechanics, it's the same type of story. Because we're big compared, we, we, we encompass many threads of history. It is difficult for us to see these quantum effects that are associated with individual threads of history. Now, if you really want a, something funky that is a very new thing of about a week or two old, is the analog of quantum mechanics and metamathematics. So one feature of mathematics is there may be many proofs of the same theorem. Those proofs correspond to different paths in what is essentially a multi-way graph. So essentially, quantum effects in mathematics are the existence of different proofs of the same thing. And most of the time, those proofs are probably continuously deformable into each other. There's no kind of inconsistency between two proofs that are both going to lead to the same thing. But it may be that there's some non-trivial homotopy in the structure of metamathematical proof space that means that you can get these two different proofs, which end up being, you'll essentially get quantum effects in proof space in mathematics. I don't yet know what the interpretation of that is in mathematics. That's a, that's a coming attraction. That still has to be figured out. Let me know if you figure it out, because uh, that, that's... Uh, um, I'll, I'll get right to work on it. <laughs> um, Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Okay. And we have Ella here, who is a speaker today that also has her hand up. Hi, Stephen. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, earlier in your talk, you mentioned something about this uh, idea of implementing something like Rule 30 um, using molecules as a new kind of substrate for computation. And, yep. I'm, and yep. I'm interested to hear you expand on that. And in particular, I'm interested uh, in knowing, would you use some uh, one of the elementary cellular automata, like Rule 30 or Rule 110, or is there some other class of cellular automata that would be like more efficient right. for the purpose? So, okay, so the first question is, um, the answer is, uh, it, it, it is unlikely to be simple cellular automata that are the best things to implement in terms of chemical computation. My current thinking about chemical computation is this. So, so when you think about these multi-way graphs, that when you do chemical synthesis, you're also thinking about things like multi-way graphs. What does that mean? You, you have some chemical, you know you can do oxidation, you can do reduction, you can do this, you can do that. Those are essentially events that can happen to a molecule. You are doing, you're taking different, doing different chemical actions on a molecule. The result of that is when you think about what can you do to get from one molecule to another, you say, well, there's a series of, of, of uh, of actions you can take on the molecule to get from one thing to another. In general, you'll build up this multi-way graph of all possible uh, chemical processes which can happen to a molecule. Chemical synthesis is like logic programming. You're basically trying to find a particular path through that multi-way graph of possible moves down to a molecule. So typical chemical synthesis, you're finding, you know, what's the best path, the shortest path, whatever else, through this multi-way graph. So that's the traditional kind of idea of, of chemistry can be thought of computationally as this question of, of sort of part, finding a path through this multi-ray graph. Okay, we can go a little bit more extreme than that. When we, when we talk about chemical synthesis like that, we're saying I can change a particular chemical species into another chemical species by doing some reaction. But what if you look at the individual molecules and you say this particular molecule can interact in this particular way with this particular other molecule? You can also build up a multi-way graph 
of the fate of individual molecules. When if you say, let's take that multi-way graph and turn it into just a chemical synthesis thing, what you're doing is it's like probabilistic programming. You've got all these different branches of all these things that happen to all these molecules. And all you care about is the overall probability to get a particular kind of molecule. But in fact, there's an underlying structure that involves these specific actions that happen on one molecule to another molecule to another molecule. And you can get these kind of complicated dynamic processes happening at the level of individual molecules. So my current guess is that the best way to think about chemical computation is a little bit like thinking about kind of all the paths in a non-deterministic Turing machine or thinking about uh, this multi-way graph of sort of all possible paths that you might use for, for computations. And that, that those are actually uh, actualized by molecules. And so when, when you just say, I just want the chemical concentration, you're kind of squashing out a lot of the potential computational information that's there. So the, the, the challenge, which I don't know how to do yet, is can you take this dynamic network of how the molecules are behaving, and can you detect features of that dynamic network? Not just how much of this molecule is there, but certain you know, details of the dynamic network. And that's where I think it will be best to encode computations. Now, in terms of what are the right, what are the right raw materials to do that with, um, I actually was playing around with combinators which are essentially tree-like expressions where you have moves that change the, the structure of the tree as at least a conceptual model for how you might make transformations on molecules. In fact, one of the more bizarre things as I was, as I was thinking about uh, in the anniversary last year of Combinators, the centenary of Combinators last year, I was wondering what would have happened if people had under really understood Combinators back in 1920 and had decided to build everything in computing on top of Combinators rather than on top of Boolean algebra and so on. And um, you know, what might have happened is people might have made molecular computers in which What's happening is these, you know, multi-way graphs of combinators and all this kind of thing. And we would have a very different intuition about how computation works. But the, you know, the practicalities of how to implement these things and molecules, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in figuring out how to do that. I don't know how to do it. I would say that the one thing which might help me a lot is somebody was asking earlier about enterprise uh, deployments of Wolfram language. One, one interesting one is a company called Emerald Cloud Lab, which is an automated biology and chemistry lab in the cloud, um, which is all based on Wolfram language, and uh, where you basically feed in a Wolfram language program to specify how all these various you know, chemistry experiments and so on should get done, and you get a result sent back to the cloud. So my hope is, my test case is, can I write a piece of Wolfram language code, or should we run in the Emerald Cloud Lab on actual molecules and actual test tubes and things, and which will compute the primes with molecules? That's my kind of test case for whether, whether I know how to do molecular computing. Can I get something where you, know, you get those stripes on some electrophoretic gel and they're in the positions of the primes? That will be, that's sort of the test case. And, and I don't think that's, I, I mean, there are, things one has to figure out to get to that point, but I don't think it's completely out of range. And I think what's needed is this different understanding of how molecular computing works than this idea that we have right now of just this one thread of computation. I think this multi-way graph idea, where there are all these different reactions happening, um, that's, that's kind of a, a, where it's a fundamentally, it's distributed computation, but the computation is, is distributed in the sense that there are many different molecules that are all reacting in parallel, so to speak. That's that's my guess. And I, you know, to, to give to fill that a little bit more, the next sort of challenge is what is the chemical observer like? That is, one way of observing what happens in molecules is just you find the concentration of, of a particular species of molecule. Another possibility is you've got some membrane in, you know, that might happen in biology. You have some membrane where a bunch of molecules are collecting on the membrane in some pattern, and then something, you know, then that's opening a pore in the membrane or something like that. That's not something which is asking for the generic, just how many of this molecule are there. It's asking a much more detailed question about, um, uh, the you know the, the the pattern of molecules and, and what they do and so sort of the challenge is to figure out how can you make a measuring device that will measure these detailed properties of detailed sort of correlated properties of molecules different from just measuring the overall concentration of molecules so that's a, at least at the beginnings of, of thinking about that I think that the, I kind of suspect that this kind of multi-way computation idea is sort of a, a key idea in thinking about chemical computation and I kind of think that 
if one can sort of untangle how to, how to think about doing computations that way, that it will give one the right intuition to be able to figure out how to do molecular scale computing. But one of the things is that we humans are used to definite threads of time. We're used to definite things happening progressively in time. Whereas this multi-computation, multi-way thing, it's all about multiple threads of, of, of history. And it's just not something we humans are very good at. We tend to want to say, let's make a reference frame, let's make a foliation where we can just break things down to say this happens, then this happens, then this happens. And I think gradually, and I, I think there's a place where you know closure and programming languages and thinking about distributed computing is important because you know we gradually will get intuition as we use these things more and more, we'll gradually get more intuition about how to think about things that don't just happen sequentially. But, but I feel I'm not there yet. I mean, it, it really helps to see the correspondence with physics because physics has essentially addressed these questions in a somewhat different way. And we're now able to import the ideas from physics into distributed computing to, to understand those better. Well, what an amazing way of, I think, finishing this uh, discussion and uh, what an amazing keynote. Uh, bringing back memories of when we finished a conference and headed uh, like to the pub to, the, to continue the discussion. We hope you're going to be like a physical maybe next time. At least in the UK is that kind of time and that kind of atmosphere. So with this last answer uh, from Steve, we are going to thank Stephen for his, av his availability, the energy it puts in everything he does and the inspiration he brought to the conference. Uh, thanks, Stephen. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thanks. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.